All right. All right. We're going to get started, started. Um, um, for, for both, both our, our audience. audience. Uh, uh, welcome, welcome to, to the Fitzgibbon Charette kickoff. kickoff. Um, 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 the lecture that we will have tonight is both streaming on Zoom and um, for our live audience of student participants that will be um, interacting in the charrette this weekend. The Fitzgibbon Charette was established in memory of Washington University in St. Louis, Professor James Fitzgibbon, who was most noted for his work as a residential designer and structural innovator. The Charette, defined as a period of intense collaborative work, focusing on a particular problem within a short deadline, a reference to French architecture students using a cart to carry their work on the day of an exhibition, is open to all juniors and seniors in architecture, and we have a wonderful group of those students here with us tonight. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderators uh, for this year's Fitzgibbon Charette, Dwayne Euler and Jenny Wu. I was lucky enough to meet Dwayne and Jenny at SciArc, where they continue to teach and make a profound impact on architectural education. Seeing them at work in SciArc's corridor, Qua Gallery, it is impossible to miss what exceptional teachers they are. From their fam famous silent reviews, a near performant art act of densely packed co-drawing, to the complex and beautifully crafted details, interlock models, and building projects that populate their studios and seminars. All of these begin to paint a picture of their values and their commitment to educating future generations of architects with a generosity that now extends to our students at WashU this weekend. In their practice, Euler Wu Collaborative, which they established in Los Angeles in 2004, their commitment to architecture as a discipline and practice and prioritization of experimentation in design, material research, and fabrication is ever more apparent. They are the best kind of architects with deep and wide interests exemplified in their range. From welding their own early small structures to speaking about their critical reflections on drawing and its relationship to building, this range is also evident in their facility in testing their intellectual project in multiple scales, designing everything from jewelry to urban parks, furniture to pavilions to buildings to cities. Their recent projects include competition winning entry for the Kaesong Museum of Fine Arts in Taiwan, the Los Angeles River Greenway Bikeway Project, the Monarch Tower, a 16-story residential high-rise in Taipei, and as finalists for the Cold War Veterans Memorial. Euler Wu Collaborative has won numerous awards, including the 2021 American Academy of the Arts and Letters Award in Architecture, the 2017 J. Irwin and Zenia S. Miller Prize, and the 2013 Design Vanguard Award from Architectural Record. In addition to teaching at SciArc, they've taught at Columbia GSAP, Syracuse University, the Research Institute for Experimental Architecture, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and the Cooper Union. Not all of them are both necessarily, but often uh, there is overlap. Um, Duane received his Bachelor of Architecture from Kansas State University and Master of Architecture from Harvard University Graduate School of Design. Prior to establishing Euler Wu Collaborative, Duane worked for Toshiko Mori Architects and collaborated with Lebius Woods on numerous projects, including Nine Boxes, Terrain, and Sightline Vienna. Jenny received her Bachelor of Arts from Columbia University and Master of Architecture from Harvard Graduate School of Design. She founded Lace by Jenny Wu, a line of 3D printed jewelry in 2014. The pieces have been widely featured in publications such as Forbes, People, and Elle magazine. Most recently, Jenny was named one of four design visionaries by Portia and Dwell magazine in their Powered by Design documentaries, showcasing her pioneering work in 3D printing. On behalf of our students, faculty, uh, and staff, thank you, Dwayne and Jenny, for being here with us this weekend for the Fitzgibbon Charette. Our participants are incredibly excited to work with you and learn from you. Uh, 
Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start out, and Jenny's going to join me uh, in a bit. Yes. Uh, I lost that control. If I, oh, no, there it is. Sorry. There we go. Um, thank you, Constance, for that. Um, and thank you for, for having us here. Uh, about half of what I want to talk about tonight is, um, is our own work, um, and about half of it is the project brief. Um, part of understanding the brief is, is getting a sense of the kind of things that drives us. So uh, I, I'm, I don't plan on going in detail into any particular project, but I, I want to give a kind of overview of, about the kind of things we do, uh, the kind of things we, we think about, um, and how those interests have evolved over the last several years. Um, so let me start out uh, just by talking about kind of who we are and, and the ways that we work. At our core, uh, we're, we're obsessive designers and makers. We make things. We make drawings. We make models. Fabrications. And strange objects. And most importantly, at least to us, we make buildings. We think that, that our life and the life of everyone that walks on this planet is elevated by the things that surround them. And we believe that our contribution as architects and designers is to provide a, a kind of sense of wonder, a sense of curiosity, and an intellectual engagement through those things. And as Constance said, the work that we do, it, it varies radically in scale. From towers to tables, from pavilions to pods, from the infrastructural to the more intimate, and from tree houses to tricycles. We believe that every way you work uh, brings a different set of criteria to the table. Be it, say, the, the spatial and structural aspects of a physical model, the precision and optimi optimization possible through digital work, the material possibility in a prototype, or the instantaneous ability of a hand sketch to convey intuitive ideas quickly. We, we ultimately hope to be seen as an office that exists in a space between the many camps and the many te techniques that, seem to, that architecture seems to produce today, both in academia um, and in professional practice. We draw every day, and it remains for us, um, both of us, our most effective form of communication. And while we still draw in conventional ways, our ways of drawing have adapted and have evolved. We're exploring new ways of communicating um, in drawn and animated form, um, a form that's become especially useful in overcoming language barriers. So this uh, animation, for example, was used as a replacement for a set of assembly drawings uh, for one of our most recent installations in Taipei. And model making remains central to the way that we work. This is especially true in regard to the intangible effects of light on a surface or, um, say, the material qualities that are so difficult to replicate quickly in a digital model. At the core of our practice, um, there's a belief that operating in the physical world is where we have the greatest impact. And we've tried to use our, our, um, our love of making as a way to, to put things out there and to kind of test them against the pressures of the real world. We started out making these, these projects out of necessity. Um, in the early days of our practice, we didn't have budgets um, to build the work, at least not to the, um, to the extent that we, we were imagining and designing them. So we, we simply said, we'll learn the skills necessary to make them happen. And we ultimately thought that we'd outgrow this kind of hands-on work. Um, and while we, we, don't, we no longer really build the, these uh, projects at the, at the large scale, 
uh, we're still uh, insistent insistent on on making things. Often, often sort of mixed, mixed in, in smaller, smaller experiments mixed in with, with projects that are being built um, by, by larger companies. Uh, but few things are as rewarding as moving from concept to built form on your own. And it's the material qualities and their, their tendencies and their resistance and the struggle that the real world development brings um, that's so essential to that reward. We're an office that, that frankly loves what we do. Um, We've used every minute of the last 15 years to shape our own lives through design and making. And the culture of our office is its very much a family that shares that ethos. Um, we live and we work in the same space. Uh, you see here our, our kids and their toys uh, are really an essential part of that experience. Um, and an interesting thing related to our own office, interesting things have been happening over the last couple of years. Um, so many of our projects are finding second lives. Um, a couple of them that I'll, I'll touch on tonight. Um, this one example, uh, a few years ago we designed a project for a 3D printing food company in, in Hollywood. Uh, a couple of former SciArc students who um, had designed a kind of technology that would print this food and they asked us to design their, their space. Um, after roughly five years, five years in that space, they lost their lease. It's a complicated story. Uh, but when they moved to this other space, they were left with the, this piece in their space and asked us uh, if we had any ideas for the piece. Um, obviously, we immediately said, yeah, we'll figure it out. Uh, so we, we went and got that piece, um, and we adapted it to become a handrail to fit within our own office. Um, but this required a, 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 about half, we were able to use about half of it, and we adapted the rest to fit our space. Um, and this is all sort of building on the, the thinking about the, the way we uh, draw and represent things differently, um, even today differently from just a few years ago. Um, in order to help with this fabrication, we used a technology called Foldogram. Um, which is essentially an augmented reality software that uses a Microsoft HoloLens as a way to, to superimpose a digital image over the, over the real world environment. Um, it, it essentially allows you to take something that's incredibly uh, complex um, and overlay it to allow for a kind of fabrication without the use of drawings at all. So you'll get a sense of, of some of that in the video here. For the last 10 years, Jenny and I talked about the, the work that we do in terms of three, three different categories, uh, line, surface, and volume. And what has maybe been the most um, interesting about the ideas has been uh, both the evolution that led to them as well as the relationship between uh, one another. And in order to talk about that, I want to give a really brief overview of each one of those and the way we've thought about them. Uh, many of these first projects involved a, a, a series of projects made up almost entirely 
of line work. So you're looking at some of the early sketches. Um, and this, is, this really grew out of a common interest between the two of us. Um, and the projects, they, they mined these types of drawings for spatial ideas. Um, really a set of principles that would help to guide the ways that we evaluated the work. We drew on ideas like density, issues of perception related to foreground and background, and the buildup of material in space. The, dry, the, the drawings, obviously hyper complex um, and often kind of unrestrained in their formal and organizational systems. And they strove for a deep sense of spatial complexity. As these um, translated into architectural projects, other factors came to bear on the, the work. Namely, the question of how you make it and, and out of what material. Um, and that began to change the work to some degree. Uh, we, we built nearly all of these projects our, our, ourselves, uh, most, most of them in the back corner of the Cyhark parking lot. Um, and like I was saying, the, the material and its behavior, um, especially the material's limitations, uh, they led to a, a formal sensibility that remains so much a part of the work today. Um, and if I could point to one single factor that led to the, the formal and aesthetic sensibilities uh, of today, it might be the, the regulated curvatures that came with, with all of these early projects. These projects allowed us to begin experimenting with more and more perceptual ideas, uh, ways of thinking about the, the body's relationship to the work, and those kind of deep spatial densities that were seen in the drawings. Um, the introduction of surface, it forced us to think about how we, um, how to simultaneously hi highlight ideas of linearity and structural systems while creating surfaces and panelization. Uh, with these projects, you, you start to notice that there's a, a really loose fit between uh, the panelization and the line work. Uh, they don't necessarily run in, in parallel to one another, and there isn't simply a strategy of filling in the gaps between frames. At times, the two are in sync with one another, with lines creating folds in the, in the surface, uh, but at other times, the two are independent and, and run... Um, they're, they're, they're both independent, but they seem sort of complementary to one another. As this uh, translated to building strategies, uh, you really begin to see that those things uh, start to work in tandem with one another. Uh, this one was a, a renovation proposal for a building in, in Los Angeles, kind of one that, that got away. Uh, and a lot of those ideas you're now seeing into trans, translated into work that's, that's current. This is the Kaohsiung uh, Museum of Fine Art that's uh, currently in construction documents. And our volumetric studies, they started with a, a set of experiments that we called active inlays. Um, the term inlay, if you think about its, its sort of conventional definition, it's used to refer to a thin surface-like material that's laid into another. Uh, but that definition, it doesn't necessarily rule out the idea that that inlaid material element isn't deep and three-dimensional. So these studies, they really exploit the ambiguity of that definition. Uh, at times, for example, they suggest a, a conventional inlay, flat 2D surfaces uh, located only at the surface. But at other times, the loose fit relationship between the object that they, uh, they inhabit reveals this deep three-dimensional object. They raise questions about the formal continuities uh, as eccentric elements seem to pass through the larger object. And the surface manipulation, uh, the product of this eccentric object, so it sort of finds its, its resting place. Uh, they're intended to produce a tension between the two, uh, at times fitting precisely, and at other times moving more independently through the space. So in this larger assembly, uh, you now see a handful of wireframe objects that reveal that ambiguity. So in the upper left, for example, or the, the, the wireframe one, in the upper left, it's ambiguous whether or not several of those elements continue through the piece. But the nature of their ge geometry suggests that they do. 
But in the wireframe system, you realize that on one side, there actually is true continuity, and on the other side, there's only the impression of continuity. The system's broken. In this example uh, of furniture, this kind of idea produces elements that at times seems to produce volumetric pieces and at times extends to only reveal a thin surface. So why does this matter architecturally? Um, as we move to buildings, this strategy sets up a certain kind of expectation about the relationship between parts. Uh, it's both formal and spatial. Uh, we can produce a sense of curiosity about the two-dimensionality of a facade by revealing certain three-dimensional curiosities. How deep is it? What is it linked to? Is it related to that space at the, at the far end of the building? In this case, um, it's for an office building that's, that's in LA. Uh, the space is linked to three the three-dimensionality of the interior lobby. Um, but, but one of the points we want to make here is that the tension produced uh, just by the suggestion of continuity is often equally as powerful as true continuity and becomes a fruitful tool for thinking about the design of architectural effects, even when continuity isn't possible. One of the issues um, that's resonated um, through all of the work has been this really intense interest in the relationship of parts. Um, and it's, it's this kind of interest that we're, we especially build on in the, the workshop over the weekend. Um, while this is apparent in the relationship of line to surface to volume, um, our most recent studies, they look closely at a set of volumetric relationships that are based more on a, a puzzle-like set of qualities. Um, so we wanted to show a few of these puzzles that we've made to help give you a sense of the kind of qualities that we find especially interesting. Um, let's start out with a, a larger idea about, about puzzles. Um, puzzles, they're, they're intentionally designed to delay your understanding. Uh, they require a kind of cognitive engagement with the nuanced characteristics of the piece. In other words, you have to study them closely. You have to work to understand them. Um, and they often reveal concealed or hidden relationships slowly over time, um, often that are deep inside the interior. Their, their geometry is central to their function as well as to their aesthetic. And that geometry, it's often propagated throughout the system. Um, why? In order to mask those that actually work and those that actually don't. So, it, you know, this starts to, there's a relationship between this and the kind of thinking in the, the active inlays in the sense that some of them uh, kind of deliver on the expectations that they set up and others don't. Um, this effectively complete, com conflates geometric patterning with true assembly systems. Each of these studies, um, they look at really different uh, forms of assembly. The previous so slide was looking at uh, forms of rotational assembly, obviously, where this one uh, simply slides and then requires um, a set of sequential movements. This spiral system, it pulls from a number of principles found in the active inlays. It, it's slicing and it's revealing just enough to provoke a sense of curiosity about the inner workings um, and the hints of the system at play. With, with many of these puzzles, uh, the reveals and the negatives also suggest other forms of, of assembly. Um, in other words, when you look at it, you almost get a sense that it might go to, together in a different way. That's often what makes puzzles work. Um, and so it's forcing that, that type of cognitive engagement. Um, these negatives, they form a kind of tension between parts, a near fit that sometimes delivers and at other times only sets in motion further investigation. Um, so again, like the, the active inlays, um, we find that this translation to, um, to architectural ideas is especially rich in, in possibility, um, particularly in terms of the perceptual understanding of the architectural parts. Well, it not, might not be so unusual to discuss the assembly of a set of architectural details. One rarely discusses program as a complex three-dimensional assembly. Um, one rarely uses the term assembly to describe the relationship of a building to a site, um, but it's our sense that, that it's this kind of odd way of thinking about uh, assembly that becomes especially interesting um, because puzzles inherently set up a greater sense of three-dimensional overlap and interlock between their parts. 
uh, our interest in this, it's, it's relatively new, and um, they're just beginning to find their way into larger projects. Uh, but one project that we, we just completed uh, was for a client that came to us um, with an interest in creating a, a set of chairs. Uh, he's a kind of collector and commissions a set of Jack and Jill, saw, uh, Jack and Jill chairs, chairs for kids. And we, we saw this as a, a pretty amazing opportunity to build on this idea. Uh, also important to say, he doesn't intend to use them so much. He wants them to function, but the point is really to, to exhibit them. Um, so we, we thought about ways that they might be exhibited as this kind of strange, almost unrecognizable uh, collection of parts that were puzzled together, but that ultimately uh, come apart to form two, two chairs. In the details, you get a sense of the small scale considerations given to that assembly. Um, rather than, than focusing on a single strategy, the projects that we do now, um, they, they actually, we, we never really go into a project saying this is going to be a project about line surface or, or volume. Uh, the projects that we do now simply are too complex to rely on any one of those, those systems most of the time. Um, so in reality, all of the projects are really a synthesis of all of these types of ideas. Um, and you really get a sense of that um, the interplay between all of those types of systems and projects like the exchange in Columbus, Indiana. At one scale, and then at a much larger scale, you see that in projects like uh, the Monarch Tower in Taipei, where line surface and volume are really all working in complementary ways with one another. This is a second tower uh, that's going up um, in Taipei now. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jenny and uh, turn the lights up a little bit. So if you have, uh, we're going to kind of go over the brief for you'll be making your own puzzling assembly t this weekend. Um, did you have something or no? Uh, I'll kind of flip through some as you do it, but they don't, they, I see. the slides I have aren't intended to perfectly correspond. Okay. okay. So you can kind of follow along with the, the handouts. Uh, do we have the handouts? And I'll, I'll just start reading. Okay, so each team of three students should create a puzzling architectural assembly using a combination of architectural and industrial parts. These parts should be taken from two to three previous architectural studio projects as well as an assigned tool model. So everyone, you're gonna take two of your previous projects. And since you have a team of three, could be a combination of, you know, project from what, two students, or if, you know, however you guys figure it out. I said, we say two to three, right? Yes. You can take yeah, parts So you can take all three. It doesn't have to be two projects, but essentially you're taking the projects that you have from your previous studios plus one additional thing, which is the tool. Which we'll talk about later. Um, Parts scale. One of the most more inescapable realities of creating building is the assembly of parts. This is true at numerous scales, from the scale of a handrail to the building mass and the type of types of parts being joined, programmatic elements, material connections, massing elements, and building to ground, for example. This exercise is aimed at creating methods of assembly that require an intense investigation of architectural parts and that allow for transference between types and scales. Simply put, we're interested in how architectural parts come together. What forms of assembly convey a clear sense of intentionality? How do they speak to one another in ways that suggest they belong together while maintaining their own individuality? And how do they speak one another in ways that suggest they can come together even when they don't? 
What kinds of architectural pieces suggest they were once together but no longer maintain the relationship? What are the architectural and aesthetic effect of this type of relationship? And what makes the spaces left between these parts, types of parts especially powerful? Okay, that was a lot of questions. So let's, let's unpack some of those a little bit. The first thing that we say there is essentially the first part of this problem is not just to get to work. It's to take a look at the things you have and interrogate their parts. What is their shape? What relationship does their shape have to other parts on, the, on that individual piece? Can they fit together? Do they fit together? What relationship do they have to other people's parts? Is there a shape language that is similar across all of them? Is there extreme difference to the shape language? And if so, what do you do with that? Uh, do the, can the, can the, are the relationships between them always sort of positive additive, additive elements? Or do additive elements in one piece fit into negative elements in the other? It's really, we're asking you first step, really interrogate those pieces because it's, it's looking to their parts and understanding them in the most intimate way that, that is the, the, you know, the successful first step into the problem. So we're not asking you to take one project and then somehow just merge with this, another project. We're really taking parts of one project or two projects or three projects and a tool and then merge them together. Okay. Um, it isn't necessary that the entirety of any projects be used. For example, you may find that one particular piece of a project fits nicely into cavities of another project, while others may go unused for the sake of the exercise. You may also find that one or both of the original project needs reordered in order to allow for assembly with others. The first step in the process is to interrogate the elements you have for characteristics that allow for assembly. You should also consider the rescaling of architectural parts to allow for more symbiotic sets, set of re relationships. So the, the parts that you have, on one hand, the, because they're all buildings, not counting the tool, there is going to be a certain scale that you've already considered. And so there's the possibility that they're going to work together. But in all likelihood, you're going to have to rescale things. And it, it becomes much more recognizable ways that parts fit into other parts, if you allow for kind of looking at them with an eye that says, I can rescale parts to, to find connections to other pieces. Should we just go to the next slide? Sure. The tools. Why have, why have the tools been added to the equation? And you guys, they don't know about the tools yet, right? But we, you, we have collected a set of 11 tools. Um, it's already digitally modeled that you guys can use to add to your projects. So these are a set of uh, really cool hand tools, like a skill saw or a leaf blower or a, you know, I don't know. There are 11 of them, and we pick them all out for specific characteristics that they, they each have. Back to you. Um, they all clearly reveal a sense of assembly. Joints are clear, seams are exposed, and gaps are left in the system in order to allow for moving parts. These characteristics should be studied closely, closely as you consider how these parts might be assembled with the architectural elements. Two, they all have some form of industrial housing, typically made of a molded plastic that conceals and protects the mechanical elements of the tool. This housing is made for accepting certain elements with the mechanical, uh, sorry, with the, with the relationship at times finding a tight fit and at other times acting as more of a loose wrapper. Consider how this housing might find a similar set of relationship as it interfaces your architectural elements. This will require both rescaling and close interrogation of its formal characteristics. So this is a, you know, when you get these tools, uh, it's not that we're also telling you to take all the parts. What we, our instinct would be to take the, the casing, the casing of the tool, because it often hides things, it, things can nest into it, and you may connect multiple pieces to it. So, and it's often housing uh, a pretty wide range of different geometries, so there are inflection points in it that suggest things belong in it or were crammed into it or, you know, it's fit snug to. Um, 
Yeah, they, they, they brought a diversity. You know, we looked at a lot of the work, uh, which looked great. But we said, how do we throw things into the equation that are sort of unexpected and that you have to grapple with? And the, the range of tools that we chose bring all of these different geometries to the, to the, to the equation. Siding. While it isn't necessary to have your architectural elements sited in a conventional sense, each team is encouraged to think of siding as yet another form of assembly. Given this objective, one, what would it mean to sit, think of the site as another part of the system? Two, how could one or more parts be assembled into the ground? Three, does the site itself have to be just one part? Four, does it have to fit tightly into the ground? Or might, it, might a loose fit suggest ways of moving through the site? Regardless of the strategy chosen, the model should not just sit on the site as though it simply a base or for an architectural object. It shouldn't feel like a spaceship landed. Yeah? Yeah. OK. Uh, flip the page. Uh, strategic assemblies and puzzling. Whenever possible, the assemble, assembled devices should demonstrate a strategic method of assembly. What we're looking for here is a systematic method of assembly that goes beyond that of a conventional puzzle. A conventional puzzle, for example, simply fits together because of the complex, um, ge uh, complex geometry of its parts. That doesn't necessarily mean that there is a method for their assembly or that it could be described strategically. The kind of strategy we're looking for is something that can be described verbally or that requires a specific action or sequence. For example, does one piece hook into another? Does it spiral into another? Does it latch itself to another? Do the parts lock together? This type of assembly requires a very precise geometric interface between the parts. This is also not an exercise in shaping a willful form making. While there's a clear, clearly a formal outcome, the intention is not to impose a formal agenda on the architectural elements you have. All geometries should be taken from the existing elements. There should not be any foreign uh, shaping, cutting, or molding that doesn't come from the pieces themselves. The only time this might be considered is in the case of transitional geometries that negotiate between one piece and another. And finally, this is in a collage or sculpture. While it may share characteristics with those, form, those art forms, the intentions driving your design process should be fo focused on assembly. OK, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, the, the first part is, I, think, I don't think you're going to be able to look to every piece and say, do I have a strategy for how these parts assemble? But, I think we're putting this part of it in here because we want you to be able to differentiate between those two types of things. A conventional 2D puzzle, it goes together only because it's, it has certain shapes. There's no strategy to it. Like you don't, there's nothing, you're not looking to that puzzle for anything other than does that shape fit in that shape. And I think the more interesting puzzles are those that are three-dimensional, and they require a certain kind of action. This has to move in in a certain way. It then has to rotate in another way. A lock moves in. Those really require complex strategies that are typically more three-dimensional, and their applicability to architecture becomes more interesting because you can think about it affecting things like program, things other than simply 2D facades. The relationship between parts becomes interlocked spatially. I mean, if you look at some of the earlier examples we showed of our own puzzles, like a lot of times the first time the thing moves, you're like, whoa, I didn't expect that to happen, you know? And so I think there, but there's a very specific, like each puzzle did one operation. It's, you know, spiraling, it rotated, it rotated a lot. And there was a very kind of intentional way of, uh, and technique of assembly. Okay, the part about, um, this is not an exercise in shaping or willful form making. Um, I don't want it that, that to be mistaken as uh, we're not saying the project isn't formal. The, the project is obviously very formal. You're looking to the shapes and the forms of the pieces. Uh, but you shouldn't take the pieces and say, I want to turn that into something of this shape. 
All the shapes and all the geometry you need, it's already there. No one should have to model any geometry. Um, you might have to connect parts in certain ways or create an interface that seems seamless. But the idea here is really you've got all the geometry. You can use it positively, meaning in an additive way, or you can use it as a, as a subtractive device, uh, digitally meaning you can Boolean things out of other things. Um, but there may be moments, some connection points, you're going to have to add and just to make it a yeah. tighter fit or a looser fit. I yeah. mean, those are, that's allowed. Yeah. It's just we don't want the new pieces, the foreign pieces you add to become bigger than the things that you have already. So, OK. Um, deliverables. So this is due Sunday. Is 10 AM the right time? OK. Let's not say that. <laughs> 10. Yes. Two 18 by 24 prints oriented horizontally. One, uh, one axonometric rendering of the overall architectural assembly. Render in one to three color materials. The model should highlight the assembly strategy over realistic materials. The intention would be to think of the rendering as more of an image of an architectural model than a rendering of a finished building. For example, imagine a model that's printed in pure white material. Some elements remain that smooth, finished white material. Other parts of the model differentiate themselves with texture and remain white. And a third material suggests it's a natural material, milled wood or cast metal, for example. Alternatively, the model could be all white or differentiated by different textures. Two, the second page. Uh, second sheet, one set of instructions that demonstrate the assembly sequence for architectural for the architectural elements. Think of this as somewhere between a set of IKEA drawing instructional manual, um, a set of construction documents, um, and uh, and an architectural <laughs> presentation drawing. As a way of guiding the drawing process. It is strongly recommend that each group find a precedent from either a product, product manual or mechanical assembly system. The drawing should include written ex, uh, descriptions, graphics that indicate movement, captions, parts called out, sequence numbers. I think we even have. Uh, yeah, maybe we have some examples of that. We're going to go through this. So two sheets, both 18 uh, by, 24. by 24, horizontal. The first sheet, it's, it's just a rendering of an axonometric. All the other stuff in there is, descri is really saying you, there's no reason to spend like tons of time on texture mapping or materiality. If it's all white, that's OK. But there are ways to use some texture mapping or materiality or texture to differentiate parts. Often it's helpful to be able to, to read an idea because you've differentiated those surfaces in some way. But it's simply an axonometric of the piece. But overall. I think what we don't want it to be sort of indexical of this one came from this project, pink came from that project. Yeah. That, that it's yeah. not a diagram. Right. Uh, the second is just a set of instructions. How does the piece go together? So we say somewhere between IKEA drawing. So we don't want it to look super cartoony like, a car like a, an IKEA drawing, but it is step-by-step -step instruction manual. But we include with it ar architectural construction documents and presentation drawings, because it's essentially a set of instructions that are using the, the language of architectural conventions um, in, in drawing to demonstrate the assembly. OK? Um, so let's walk through a couple of So uh, this is going to be a little bit all over the place, but there is one image on the bottom I want to talk about a, a little bit. Um, that, that image is an interesting one to me. That was a, a, a SciArc project from a couple years ago. But I think it's a really beautiful way to think about siting. So that object had been designed, wasn't quite a building yet, and the student sited it. And the, the way of siting it was they took the object and they placed it on one end of a surface. And they began to rotate it through the surface. And that, create, that created a mark in the ground. And then they rotated it again and it created another mark. And then they rotated it or pushed it down a little bit, and it dug a deeper hole. All the way, all the, the way, leaving marks in, the, in the, the ground. And as it did that, it left remnants of itself. So you see a couple of pieces that were kind of left in the landscape. And eventually, the piece becomes deep enough and uh, sequentially embedded enough 
that there, there is a very subtle sense that it had to kind of nestle itself into the site and find its way. Now, in a real site, you might think, diff- you might think of it in the opposite way. Like, you're, you know, site specificity is ultimately looking to a site that has a set of characteristics that help you relate. A lot of sites don't have that. And so you might think about this as, as finding your, or creating your own kind of site specificity by allowing the building to manipulate the site in that way. Um, a, a bit of a side note, a few of the, there's an artist that we've been looking at for the last few year, years um, named Miguel Baracal. He was a Spanish artist, but he worked mostly out of um, Verona, Italy. Um, and he, relatively long career from the 60s until I think he died in 2007. This is one of his earliest works. Um, but all of his work, um, some, this was one of the more abstract ones. Uh, some of them became a little more realistic. He was interested in uh, torsos and things like that. But they were all essentially these beautiful, puzzling assemblies. And uh, some of them incredibly complex. That first image made out of, uh, with the wood was a, was a Baracol piece. Uh, some small, some large. You can still buy some of these in museum shops. Uh, you know, they cost a couple hundred bucks, and they're really incredible little pieces. Uh, other examples, this is a much later one. Some of the work became much more uh, organic, at least on the exterior. But the interiors were always um, much more uh, mechanical and clearly a language of assembly. Um, and some of the projects that came out of this wasn't looking at Barakal. This was a, a different kind of puzzle. This was a, there were these really fascinating puzzles called Hanayama puzzles. Probably some of you know them. Uh, a Japanese maker, they make tiny little you know, $15 three-dimensional puzzles. And these are the kind of projects that were coming out of, of those. This was not yet an architectural project, but a first step out of, out of the Hanayama puzzle, trying to three-dimensionalize that problem um, spatially. And another example, often with these, these problems, what we'll do is first look at a Barakal um, uh, and, and ask that that be translated into a, a more three-dimensional, uh, more abstracted piece that really builds directly from the type of assembly methods that were happening in the Barakal. This is uh, coming out of our, our, our studios uh, at SciArc and other places we teach. So, and this exercise typically takes longer than one weekend, but. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and we, we've just included a handful of um, instructions just so you, you know, to re-emphasize the kind of look that we're looking for. Um, probably the most well-known one is the Morphosis drawings um, from, I don't know, this is almost 40 years ago at this point, um, but a really beautiful set of assembly drawings. Um, and some that, this is one that, that came from one of those studios. Um, you'll notice heavy emphasis on uh, graphics. You know, what makes the instructions work is, is there's, they're, it's, they're often coupled with graphic arrows, numbers describing the sequence, a verbal written description. It's really what differentiates uh, these types of assembly drawings from pure architectural drawing. But the drawings themselves are still very much part of the, the, the lineage of architectural drawing. And another example. All right, get to work. Um, so for, I wonder if anyone on Zoom can hear me. Uh, you could welcome questions from the microphone. Sure, sure. We have one question on Zoom, and then we'll field questions about the project uh, once we step off Zoom. If anybody has a question pertaining to anything that is not the project, which I'm sure your brains are just boiling on the charrette at this point. Um, but I will forward that first question. Sure.
I'll assume the question was really about the white ones we made, probably. Yeah. Um. I mean, I think a lot of these, uh, you know, when we teach it in our studio, like we, like the Hanayamas, they can, we actually buy a Hanayama and then students have a way to understand how they come together. When there's a physical object, it, it, it's actually easier because they can understand this. Because when you, when you actually put it together, these puzzles are quite hard. Like there's a very specific, specific way they like rotate in and click. But if you just didn't know, like they, they're just, you know, it takes me a long time to figure them out. Now, I think when we have worked on it in the office and maybe because our experience of knowing how the kind of uh, assembly method and the action it takes and the kind of effects we're trying to create, you know, we kind of bypass the kind of physical kind of act, like modeling it but we just go more, more or less into the digital process, yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, all, all that is true. I'll answer a slightly different way. Um, uh, when we first started making those puzzles in the office, um, everyone wanted to make um, it do everything. Like, I'm gonna make it rotate here, and I'm gonna make it twist this way here, and it's gonna pull this way, and, and then it's gonna slide. And those were interesting, but they, they, they were very quickly a mess. And so at some point we said, no, 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 one, one kind of action is what you're going to do first. And um, if they could do that one action in a, in a really elegant and interesting way, it was enough. And so the, the, the way to work on it then became step by step. All right, you got one action happening in this brick. Uh, now how do you add another layer of, of that? Can you, can you take that, that action and split it in this direction? Can you add one at a different scale? Have you affected all of the elevations? Uh, you know, what does it look like when you open it up sectionally? So once you get to that, that first interesting thing, it's just a matter of continuing to ask more of the, of the piece. And I, I think when you guys start your process, you should also just start with one first big idea, you know? It doesn't have to assemble in every different way and, you know, slide, click, you know, what does it obviously might want to do? Try to work on that problem, and then then other scales of operations will will come. Yes. Right. I think the the monarch projects. Usually, we give the second half of the. The lecture, which is all just we go deep dive into the projects, and so we kind of skip that part this time. But um, we talk about how in in Taiwan uh, there's a practice where there's architects. I mean, they already design the footprint and the floor plan, and they hire foreign architects to do the facades. So in that project, we were given something like two and a half feet on the side facade and five feet in, in the front facade to do all of our design, but then somehow make it feel integrated and work with the floor plan they gave us, which is super complicated. Um, and so there was this, you know, there was a lot of, uh, and maybe because of our kind of naivete that we didn't realize how the thing that we designed where Basically, every kind of balcony was different, the windows were different, the panels were different, was like a thing they've never done before. And that one, these are kind of luxury apartments and they didn't even know if you can possibly sell an apartment that didn't look like another apartment next to it. And so this was all a kind of very uh, big uh, experimentation that we were happy to say that they all sold really well and they were an you know, art developer. That's why they gave us a second project. Um, but yes, it was a facade project. But we worked very hard to not, for the kind of depth we had, try to make it not feel like we just added a facade. We just, no. We just landed. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? 
Are you guys ready to assemble? <laughs> I feel like we're like in a Marvel movie. Uh, yeah.